Okay, so I've, I've, I've made reference to you guys before quite a few times about how much I have an aversion to memorization. Um, turns out, I don't think that's a pro in terms of my outlook on learning. Sometimes it's just better to memorize some things and not make ourselves go through some of that stuff. But I'm going to start this uh, lesson as if I have not memorized some of the inverse trig derivatives, and then um, I'll, I'll polish it up by using memorization as opposed to um, a developmental approach, let's say. So I want to start with the, the first part, because if you ever are on a test and you cannot remember one of the rules, you don't have to have them memorized. We can develop them, and they're not that hard. It does take a couple of minutes, but it's doable. So let's see what we got. That's the bell. People are going to be going up to lunch here in a second. So let's see what we got. So let's just say somebody says, hey, I have this story right here. Or in other words, I have y is the sine inverse of x. And I would like to know what is the derivative of that. So the first thing that I would do personally when I was in college and, and late in high school is I'd say, oh, well, I don't know what that is. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the inverse trig because I would rather go ahead and do it in that way. So I have that the sine of y is x because the inverse of sine inverse is sine. So I took the sine of both sides. Now, this is a little, a bit of an interesting little story because as soon as we say it in this way, then that makes the value y, the angle effectively, if you're thinking about it, theta. And the derivative of sine is the cosine times the derivative of what's inside, but we know the derivative of y itself is dy dx. The cosine of x is one. So again, because we have done implicit derivatives, this is a good way to do it. But if you look right here, the definition of sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So when we look at this problem, the definition says that the sine, no calculus here, is opposite over hypotenuse, and a quick Pythagorean theorem would, would finish off that triangle with a one minus x squared. So what I know then is that dy dx is equal to one divided by the cosine of y. But if you look over here, and we know what the cosine of y is, the definition of cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I have adjacent, which is one minus x squared over one, but it doesn't really make sense to do that. And I've just found the derivative. Now, again, if you have this fact memorized that the derivative of a sine inverse is one over one minus x squared, then we're good to go, okay? Now, let's go ahead and take another look at that on the cosine. So just like what I did before, I'm gonna start with y is the inverse cosine. I'm gonna take the cosine of both sides and just like before, I'm gonna generate a little quick triangle off of this. And that means if the cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, that's gonna make this thing one minus x squared. Notice it's exactly the same triangle we had over here, just you know, kind of rotated, if you will. It's the same triangle. So if we were to take our derivative, remember the derivative of a cosine is the opposite of sine, but chain rule still kicks into place. This is an implicit derivative, dy dx equals one. So dy dx is really just one divided by the sine of y. And again, if we go back and look at this, the sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is again, just opposite over one, which doesn't do much, but then I still have that negative. So we usually choose to put that negative in front. So the derivative of an inverse cosine is negative one over one minus x squared. And this kind of bothered me when I was in college and in high school, because if you look at those two derivatives, they look almost identical. That really, really bothered me. But notice that the sine is positive as the derivative of sine has been in the past, and the derivative of cosine is negative as cosine has been in the past. So I'm gonna pause this for a second to get somebody something they need, okay? So I'll be right back. Okay, so we'll be right back at that. So um, we'll look at a couple more. Let's look at a tangent. Now I'm not gonna do all six, I just was gonna do a couple. Now, uh, just as we did before, if I said y is the tangent inverse, I'm gonna take the tangent of both sides and therefore the tangent and the tangent inverse would cancel. Now, we keep getting this same kind of story that we have the angle here is y, 
the tangent is opposite over adjacent. Oh, that's not exactly the same triangles we had. Notice before it was the hypotenuse that's one and now it's not. So now if we do the Pythagorean theorem, this one is just regular one plus x squared under a root. So if we were gonna go ahead and take the derivative of this implicitly, we would get secant squared y times dy dx equals x. Now, different people would do this differently. You could choose to divide both sides by a cosine squared, which is perfectly fine, uh, or excuse me, by the secant squared. But that's actually pretty nice because that is just, and I also need to be careful because I'm a little distracted now, that's a one. And so keep in mind, this is one over secant squared, but one over secant squared is identical to just saying the cosine squared. And that's kind of nice because if you look over here, the definition of cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent over hypotenuse, but what happens if we have that cosine and then we square it, we just get a nice easy one over one plus X squared. So, what you might realize pretty quickly, remember how the derivative of a tangent was secant squared? We have that right here, but the derivative of a tangent was positive. Well, in the same way, how the derivative of a sine inverse, of a sine inverse of x was one over root one minus x squared, and the derivative of the cosine inverse was the same thing, but with a negative, we could play the same game because the derivative of a tangent inverse was one over one plus x squared, the derivative of the cotangent. Uh, again, like I said, I'm not gonna go through every single one of them because the video would get obnoxiously long. It's gonna be the same derivative, but just with a negative. If we could find out what the derivative of a secant would be, because remember the derivative of secant was secant tangent, the derivative of the these two are going to actually be, this cosecant inverse, are going to be the same entity except with a plus and a minus. So I figured we should take a look at one of those. And so I just, for giggles, decided to go with the cosecant first. And I have it right here. So again, just as before, we're going to start with the cosecant inverse. And I'm going to choose to flip things around a little bit by taking the cosecant of both sides. Now, yet again, the definition of a cosecant, again, y is the angle. The definition of cosecant is a hypotenuse over opposite. And so what I can do is I could take the square root of a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So c squared minus a squared equals b squared. So we have something like x squared minus one, right? And, okay, so if I were to take the derivative of a cosecant, I get negative cosecant y cotangent y times dy dx equals 1. So that would mean dy dx, if I divide both sides by a negative cosecant, that's like multiplying both sides by a sine, and dividing both sides by a cotangent is like multiplying both sides by the tangent. Now, this is a little trickery, but it's not too bad. And so if we go back and look at this problem, the definition of a sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And the de definition of a tangent is opposite over adjacent. So this is pretty much the way we do that problem. The only thing that I will say is the way these problems work out, there's supposed to be an absolute value on this x because no matter what we do, and it has to do with the fact that the inverse needs to be one to one and these graphs go on forever, we actually make sure that they're sitting in a place where that x value, that hypotenuse would be a positive entity, okay? So that is my cosecant and keep in mind, these are gonna look exactly the same the only difference is the secant is not going to have a negative on it. So if you have a problem where you have these things memorized, you don't have to go back out and generate them all the way from scratch. So that could be pretty helpful. So make sure that you pause this and get those written down. If you don't have them, it's going to be pretty useful for us. So, so um, anyway,
Uh, two more of those, and then I think that'll be the end of this video, and I'll do another one. Instead of where we use logic to come up with those things, we're going to go ahead, and in the last video, I'm going to go ahead and use the rules to generate them in a more rapid manner with chain, okay? So, again, this is just how I handled these problems when I was uh, in your situation in high school. So, the cotangent of y is equal to 3x over 5. Again, I always start off with that idea. I go over here. Now, this is the first one. That notice that I'm actually dealing with a little bit of a chain rule because there's something going on inside. So the angle is here. The cotangent is adjacent over opposite. Pythagorean theorem would make this 9x squared plus 25. Again, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And the derivative of 3x over 5 is 3 over 5. So just as we've done in the previous problems, if I divided both sides by a cosecant squared, that's the same as multiplying both sides by a sine squared. And so here we go. Let's figure out what the sine is. And the sine, according to this, would be opposite over hypotenuse. And you'll notice that in this case, the square and the square root cancel out, which is not too bad. Five squared is 25. I still have the negative three fifths in front. Those would cancel one more time and I have my final answer. Now again, there are those that would say that memorizing is faster, but I felt like that was pretty quick. Or at least I always felt like it was fairly fast when I did it this way. Okay, last one. Secant of y equals four x squared. Okay, so here we go. Again, as always, y becomes my angle. The definition of a secant is the reciprocal of a cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this is hypotenuse over adjacent. Now keep in mind, this is gonna need to be a positive value, which in the case of uh, that square, it would be. And so I'd have 16 x squared minus one because I have to do c squared minus a squared equals b squared. So the derivative of a secant is a secant tangent. And I'm gonna use the y prime notation. And of course the derivative of four x squared is eight x. Now effectively what you're gonna see then is this is a little playing with the chain rule because notice the derivative of the inside piece is eight x. So y prime would be eight x multiplied by a cosine y because to get rid of a secant, I could multiply both sides by a cosine. And to get rid of the tangent, I can multiply both sides by a cotangent. And so all I have left to do is substitute in the numbers that I know. And a cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse. And a cotangent is, instead of opposite over adjacent, it's adjacent over opposite. And a little bit of cleanup, notice that the eight and the four would cancel, the X and the X would cancel. So I end up with a denominator of the root of 16 X squared minus one. And since all of these things cancel, um, I just have a two left on top and an X on the bottom. But as mentioned in the previous piece, we wanna have an absolute value on that X to be completely above four. All right, that'll be enough for inverse tangents for this one. On the next video, I'm gonna go ahead and just use the rule and show that we can, using memorization, we can actually get there a little faster. Okay, see you back in class, bye-bye.